I could take long walks the way I used to with my binoculars and artisan field guides, walking off my loneliness, stopping to make notes about birds and flowers, classifying them as the family, genus, and species, as if they really told me where they came from. I could try the bar scene, looking for a friendly face or a saucy grin, but no, I've done that. Was it this lifetime or the one before? In any case, it wasn't very satisfying then, and it wouldn't be now, not after seeing your face, your smile. Oh, love, what could I do without you? Thank God I'll never have to find out. Because my love, my sweetheart, my beloved, I will never, never, never let you escape from my heart. Last, uh, last armor teethy, we had a remarkable rainbow in Maui where we were at the time. And it made us realize that every incredible rainbow we've ever seen is associated in some way with Mega Bob. This particular one came on the evening before Armor Teeth in Hawaii. It was two hours after sunset, totally dark, looking out over the ocean. And suddenly a rainbow, a regular rainbow, forms over the ocean with scintillating colors. Of course, not quite as brilliant as it one in daytime because the only light to produce it, I suppose, came from the, the full moon which, which had just come over the mountains back behind us. But this had all the colors of a rainbow. And we couldn't believe it. We were talking about it, several of us, Baba lovers, who were going to Armour TT celebration the next day. And somebody said, what time is it? We looked at the time. It was 8.30 in Hawaii. 8.30 p.m. In India, it was 12 noon on Armour TT. Just when hey, Baba <laughs> dropped his body. So that made me think about some other special rainbows which we've seen all associated with Baba. The first one of any uh, consequence that I recall was during our first trip to India in 1973. We flew from Miami to London and just as we were circling to land in London, circling over the city, I looked out of the airplane looking down toward the city of London, rather cloudy, and there was a beautiful circular rainbow with a shadow of our plane in the middle of it. And actually this is not, this is not a real rare experience, experience I've found out since. We've seen others, but that's the first time we ever saw one. And of course, to us it seemed that Baba was just saying that he had our plane in his arms. So we thought it was an incredible experience. A few years later, while Peggy and I were having Baba meetings in Key Biscayne, Florida, which is seven miles from the from Miami across the causeway. Peggy and I were both working at the University of Miami at the time. We had a Baba meeting this night. We started across the Rickenbacker Causeway through our quarter in the toll gate basket. It was raining slightly. And just as we started across the causeway, I'm driving and I see colors 
from the hood of our car in, in the rain. I'm, I'm seeing these strange colors dancing there. Then I look up and I see that there's a rainbow extending from about the, the hood of our car to the horizon. Oh my God. And as we drove along, it went right with us. Stay there. And I said, take a look at that. We're both so excited we can hardly talk. And uh, Peggy said, what do you think these other people in the other cars think of this? <laughs> you know? And she said, you think we ought to stop? And I said, I'm afraid to. I'm afraid to go away. So we keep driving. The, the rainbow remains. About halfway there, we crossed a bridge and went to an area where there were large trees on both sides of the road. As soon as we hit that area, the rainbow foreshortened it. It, it came in so that the, the other end of it was on the other side of the road, at the edge of the trees, and it still went to our car, like this. Mm -hmm. We hit an open area again, and there it went to the horizon again, still from our car to the horizon. And it continued to seven miles until we turned into the road leading to our house. And I wrote a poem about it and said it followed me that night. I had always thought that a rainbow had to be opposite the sun, had to be on the horizon, and that it was impossible to be at the foot of a rainbow. But it happened. The last amazing rainbow, I mean before the one I told you about Armajiti, we were in India a few years ago. That day, I had spent some time in the Samadhi on the hill sitting alone there. Fortunately, it was one of those rare times these days when you sit alone in the samadhi. <laughs> but I was alone for quite some time. And I asked Baba to enlarge my heart so it could hold more of his love. I never had used that figure of speech or that thought before. I never had asked him to enlarge my heart. Somehow I did. And I continued to sit in the samadhi. And then three Indian men came in. And I noticed one of them placed a photograph of Mayor Baba, a 10 glossy photograph, on the right side of the foot of Baba's tomb. Another 8 to 10 photograph of Hazrat Babajan on the other side. And then I realized that's Baal Natu doing this. First time I'd ever seen Baal Natu at the tomb. And two other men were with him. He fixes the, the photograph of Baba, the photograph of Babajan there, bows to both of them, and then they put garlands on the tomb and they suggested I help them, and I helped them put the garlands on the tomb. They left. A little later, I left the tomb, went down the hill, and later that day, Peggy and I, about an hour before evening arty, decided to go up the hill. After we crossed the railroad track, we happened to look back at Lower Maribod, and there was a wonderful rainbow over all of Lower Maribod. We'd never seen a rainbow in India before. We continued up the hill, and the farther we got up the hill, the more spectacular it got. It soon formed a double rainbow. By the time we got to the top of the hill, it, it was the most magnificent single rainbow I think we'd ever seen. And there, there, were, there were a couple of Bible lovers up there staring at it already in Dagmar Life in Paris took pictures of it. Some of you may have seen a picture she, she took of it. While we were there, Marge, the woman from Canada who hands out facade much of the time, came out and said, I was just in there 
asking Baba, I said, Baba, why don't you ever give us rainbows? It rains a lot in Maribog, but I've never seen a rainbow here. And then she came out and saw that rainbow. So that evening, Marge went and looked at her Mayor Baba calendar to see if something was special about that day, it was September 21st. And she saw it was the anniversary of Baba John's passing. So she told us, that was the next day she said, that was the anniversary of Baba John's passing. We said, oh, so that's why I found not to took the pictures out there and, and took the darshan. So we rode the, uh, the bus to Marizad. And when I saw Bal Matu, I said, Bal, you know, when you, when you went out to the tomb on Babajan today, we had an incredible rainbow after that. Unbelievable rainbow. He said, I didn't know that was Babajan's day. <laughs> I said, if you didn't know that was Babajan's day, why did you go out there with a photograph of Babajan and a photograph of Bob? and put him at the foot of the tomb and bow to them. He said, I've had two dreams about Babajan recently. And the night before that, I had a dream of Meher Baba and Babajan in the same dream. And that had never happened before, so I decided to go out to the tomb the next day. So that explained that. And there's one more postscript to this from a personal standpoint. After that day of the rainbow and, and seeing Val, Val not too up there and so forth, that night, rather early the next morning, Baba starts answering the, the prayer I'd made in the Samadhi to enlarge my heart. I woke up about an hour before Arti, early Arti, morning Arti, and it felt as though Baba had both of his hands inside my heart and he was pulling, stretching. And it was excruciating. It was, it was ecstatically painful. I w didn't want him to stop and at the same time I, I couldn't help crying out. And I was thinking, thank God I have a, I'm in a, a private room. I think it was the first time I'd ever been in a private room at the Pilgrim Center. But I thought if somebody else was in the room, I, I'd go through agony trying to stop from crying out. But I couldn't help it. And uh, that's my story about rainbows. <laughs> it means a lot to me personally as well. This is Peggy. Last, uh, yesterday, Somebody asked, if any of you don't know my wife Peggy, she's sitting right back there. Hold your hand up. <laughs> <laughs> We've been married 54 years. Not one fight, right? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. Sometime yesterday, I believe, somebody asked us, what was the best year? you had, we said the 50th. And uh, you asked it, didn't you, Lord? And she said, why? And I said, I'll tell you tomorrow. Actually, the 50th was the best. And at the same time, I have to say that each year gets better than the one before, but the 50th, 50th was very, very special. The first time that that Peggy and I went to India. And the first time we met Padre in Lower Maribor, Padre says to me, how old are you? And I told him, what was I? 48, 73, 48. Peggy's my best editor as well as, as the prophet. <laughs> I told him, and, and Padre said, you could have seen him. You could have seen him. I said, yeah, I could have seen him. I, I'm old enough. Yeah, I could have seen him. 
He said, mark my word, mister, you didn't get here by accident. You've had some kind of contact with him. So I was happy to hear that. And like all of us who are old enough, and that means most of us, old enough to have seen Mayor Baba, <laughs> we start thinking back, trying to determine when we might have seen Mayor Baba. And there, there were a number of possibilities as it happened. In 1952, when Mayor Baba left Myrtle Beach, traveling west, followed U.S. 64 through North Carolina, Tennessee, Arkansas, and on to Oklahoma where he was injured in this terrible automobile collision. And then in an amb ambulance later made the same trip back, U.S. 64. At that time, I was practicing law in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I practiced law for about two years at that time. My parents lived on U.S. 64, which was Brainerd Road, the main thoroughfare. Peggy's parents lived about a block off U.S. 64. We lived about two blocks off U.S. 64. Every day, going back and forth to my office, we traveled five miles off U.S. 64 downtown in the evening, five miles back. Also, that same year, I traveled U.S. 64 east on the same route Baba took up through the mountains, through Okoy, Highlands, that area to try a lawsuit in North Carolina. So after thinking about it a good bit, I could almost persuade myself I remember seeing that car. You know, I, I could almost swear I'd seen that car seeing that figure in, in white and the women in the car. Oh boy. But I don't, I don't know that I ever did. I could almost convince myself I did. I didn't know it. So, as a result, it was, uh, it was 1994 when we were about to celebrate our 50th anniversary when we first discovered an earlier link. Up until that time, my main claim to a link to Mayor Baba came through my wife Peggy. Peggy was born in Rome, Georgia on the evening, the night of July 9, 1925. In India, it was about 5 o'clock in the morning on July 10, 1925, when she was born. And that's the time in which we measure Baba Solomon, of course. Because of that birthday, Peggy has always been in a very delicate dilemma. While she is proud of the fact that she was born at the same time Baba began his silence, and that Baba was speechless after she was born. <laughs> at the same time, she can't reveal that fact without telling how old she is. <laughs> but in 1994, when we went to India, we discovered a closer link. When we arrived there, I stayed at Lower Maribod the first day, so we could go up the hill and spend time in Samadhi. And Peggy went to Marizad. As soon as she greets Monty, Monty says, Do I have a surprise for you? Peggy says, Surprise? What kind of surprise? Monty says, what do you know about the romance of pearls? It so happened that Peggy knew a lot about the romance of pearls. In 1963, I was making my living freelance writing for magazines. And writing 
writing some books too. We'd begun writing books about the sea for children and, and, and some adult books too. And I had begun to sell, I'd been selling articles to the Saturday Evening Post and, and Reader's Digest, which were the best freelance markets. I had an assignment to do a, an article about pearls. A lot of my articles were about natural history. We, we titled it The Romance of Pearls. But I bogged down. I was having trouble completing this article. The deadline was approaching. They wanted the article. I was tearing my hair out. I didn't often have writer's block, but I couldn't finish that. So Peggy takes hold of it. She's desperate. We need that money. She, she rewrites the whole piece and does a beautiful job. And I said, I'm going to put your name on this one with mine. I never had, she and I had never shared a byline at that time on, on an article. So I told the editors I wanted to be by, by William and Peggy Stevens. And Monty pulls out this copy of the December 1963 Reader's Indian edition of Reader's Digest with a beautiful picture on the front of the Madonna and Child and the article inside by William and Peggy Stevens. It seems that that book had been kept for 31 years in the in the reading room where they, they, they keep their special books and magazines. And Laurel McGreeny ran across it, saw the article and went to Monty with it and said, have you been keeping this magazine all these years because Bill and Peggy wrote this article? She said, no, we didn't know Bill and Peggy in 1963. We've been keeping it because Mara liked that article so much, she showed it to Bob. And Baba had me read the article to him. And she said, and invariably when Baba would ask me to do that, I would, I would say, Baba, this article is titled The Romance of Pearls by William and Peggy Stevens. And he would nod and she'd start reading it. So, <laughs> as you can imagine, this was the greatest gift that that we could have received just before our 50th wedding anniversary. Monty gave us that magazine and is now among our Bob treasures. And uh, that's why our 50th anniversary year was the greatest one. But truthfully, they do seem to get better after a certain point. <laughs> we, we pointed at it. <laughs> well, you have your, I guess you always have your ups and downs, but after, after a certain point, uh, instead of having your ups and downs here, you're having your ups and downs on a different level. I wanted to uh, talk some about my, some of my favorite saints and masters. First, though, I remember last year looking at Adele here. Adele said, next time you need to talk some about your children and grandchildren, and I haven't, have I? So just very briefly. <laughs> Peggy and I, I came to Bob in a, during a near-death near experience. A, ten years earlier, I'd almost died in a deep underwater cave, and only by the grace of God was I, did I escape, was saved, but I was still, it, it really shook my agnosticism, but I, but I didn't, I didn't really couldn't really accept the idea that there could be an omnipotent God who really cared about me as an individual. It was hard for me, I guess with my scientific training and legal training, 
uh, that's no excuse, but but I couldn't couldn't accept it. I did accept it after I went through the experience of dying and thought I was dead and saw this incredible light and, and, and felt uh, of God everywhere and, and, and saw Bob's face as I later determined, determined it. But I was so different after that. And Peggy hadn't run it, hadn't read a thing about being a Bob. That Peggy didn't know whether this was a, a real change or not. I was I was kind of wild eyed and uh, <laughs> I guess I reminded her of some of these, these, these people you might run into in the park. I remember one time there was a man who said, I've spoken to God! I've talked to God! <laughs> and uh, you kind of back away. <laughs> Maybe he did, but... <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> and, and, and Peggy, I guess, felt a little bit that way. <laughs> just, just a little. She knew, she knew uh, how I was was a big improvement. <laughs> but, <laughs> but what was happening? <laughs> I might get farther out. But first time I went to the center, she went with me. She hadn't read anything about Bob. We didn't know whether the Mayor Center in Myrtle Beach was a suitable place to take children. So we, so we left our children with Peggy's sister. We drove to Myrtle Beach. Elizabeth Patterson took us to the Piggly Wiggly, drove, with, drove in her car, we followed her, got groceries, she went back with her and served we didn't realize what a fantastic honor this was. You know? She didn't know us from anybody. Practically from the first time Peggy went inside the streets, she'd find herself weeping. Went on for three days, like I said. Then when we drove back to Miami, she became violently sick a couple of times. Maybe all the way. We had to stop the car so she could throw up. But she loved Bob from that moment on. <laughs> from, the, from the time she got to the center. So, so we went back and took our children. Three of our children. Our oldest son, Don, had left home. Three younger children went to the center in the early 1970s. They became instant Bob lovers. There's so many children do. And even though Don, who had left home, did come to see us twice while we were at the center. He went on the center. But it wasn't his time. He said he didn't need a master. I mean, her Bible might be, might well be who we say he is, but he didn't need a master. So as the years went on, all of our other children were Bible lovers, and they had children, and their children were Bible lovers. And Don and Roger, our two boys, bought property in Little Valley in North Carolina. Their houses were opposite one another. He walked across from one house to the other. And when Peggy and I would visit, where do you stay? <laughs> You stay with Don and you can't talk about Papa. You stay with Roger, it doesn't seem fair to Don. You stay with Roger, his wife's a Baba lover, his children are Baba lovers. And if we all get together, what do you talk about? You know, I mean you can you can talk a little while, but if you can't mention Baba's name, fear of offending somebody, nobody's real comfortable. So that's an awful situation to be in with your family. In the 1980s, Baba had made me go back to practicing law. And I was representing the poorest of the poor by American standards. 
people who are disabled, been denied their benefits. And yet, he was sending he was sending the people in, and and, uh, and, and our, my practice was flourishing, and I had to get a couple other lawyers to help me. I had so many cases. It was, it was unbelievable. So Peggy and I, for the first time, were able to start going to India every year. Oh, that's wonderful. After a couple of years of that, we're coming back from India, and we start thinking. From now on, we should take one of our children with us every year. Wouldn't it be great if we could somehow con Don into going? So we cooked up a kind of a contest. It sent a notice out to all the children. The winner was going to receive a free trip to India with us. All expenses paid. He said, of course, Roger, since he had been to India twice before, he will be willing to, to not apply for it this first time. He, he wasn't willing, but he couldn't do anything about it. So we, we told Roger, all right, whoever wins, if they don't meet all our requirements, they have to have a passport by a certain day, they have to have a visa by a certain day, they have to be willing to to follow all the rules of, of, of the center and so forth. We, we rigged it so Don would win if he applied and he won. He got it. But he, didn't, he didn't know it was rigged. And, uh, <laughs> so Roger is saying Don will never get it together. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go if he, because I was, I'm the second, I'm going to go. If, and uh, Bob lovers would visit Roger. They stopped by Don's house, and, and, and Roger would have told him. And they, that would say, "You plan to go to India? Whoa, boy, it, it's an awful dirty place. You get dysentery. You, uh, <laughs> you better be careful when you go there." Don would say, "I'm going. I'm going." Don told his two sisters. Sure, I want to go with mom and dad. But as soon as they get to that Baba place, I'm out of there. I'm going to travel around <laughs> India. I'm not required to stay there. So we went. And we stayed overnight out at Juhu Beach. Don and I rode camels on the beach. We saw a Indian snake charmer with a cobra. Don was a snake man. When he was young, he collected snakes. He knew all the snakes. He was completely captivated by what he was seeing and very much touched by all the poverty. We get to Maribod. We get there. Don and I are sharing a room. And I say, Don, I'm going to go up the hill. Now, you know, you don't need to go with me. If you want to go with me up the hill, you can. In fact, he said, yeah, I'd like to go. I said, now we get up there, don't feel compelled to go inside the tomb. You don't have to do that. I'm not expecting anything. So I go up there and take Bobby Darshan. A little later, I realized he has gone into the tomb. He didn't bow down, but he went in there for a while. So then, the next day, he tells his mother, Mom, I don't know why I was crying up there. He said, I think it was because of all the poor people I saw in Bombay. She said, maybe so. <laughs> we, we had warned all our friends there. Now, our son is with us, not Babalo. After a few days, they were saying, you know, he acts like Babalo. <laughs> he, he's embracing people now. <laughs> So came the day that Irwin Luck was showing his film up in the study hall on the hill. And Don and I went up there to look at him. And Don really flipped over that film. At the end of it, he's up there talking with Irwin all about it. And, and Don says to me, you know, at that time, Irwin was 
about to have the first premiere, the first public showing in Norfolk. And Don said, you know, maybe I can take Susie and, and the boys and we can go up there and see that. Because everybody needed to see that film. A little later I went over and take Bob to Darshan, leaving him there talking with Erwin. A little later I saw Don come over, so I pretend not to see him. You know, I'm, I'm back where I can look into, in, into the tomb. So I look at my feet a while and look up, he's in the Darshan eye. Look up and he's pretty close. <laughs> then when he, he goes into the tomb, I'm looking up, and he goes and bows in the tomb. He bowed at the tomb. And from then on, he was wearing bobble buttons, saying J bobble. <laughs> when we flew back, his wife and his brother Roger met us in Atlanta at the airport. They met and they couldn't believe Don had his new <laughs> <laughs> They stared at him, you know, and looked at us. <laughs> so, Don made up for lost time after they had taken the children to, to the center. I have to tell one more thing about the children now. In 1990, we decided we'd take all of them at once to India. Baba had been very good to us in the meantime, and so we ended up ten of us going, all the, all the children and their spouses, who had spouses, and also my sister went, and a family friend, there were eight actual family members, and my sister and, and, and an old family friend. Ten people traveling, we had to make elaborate plans, we'd have to take three taxi cabs and make sure they stayed together, we'd take the train, everything went, on, went over beautifully. Don's wife, Susie, I think really hadn't read anything about it, maybe a little bit, even though she had been to the center. She didn't, she had read much about Bob. The night we get to Maribod, we go up the hill. Susie didn't realize you're not supposed to step up on the marble beside the tomb. We'd send all kinds of letters about things you should do, don't give money to the beggars, Baba said, so forth. And, and I think we covered that, but anyhow, she did that. And Dolly Dostura went in and Lightly kind of pulled her out and talked to her and said, Now, for punishment, you'll have to come up here and clean the tomb tomorrow morning. Of <laughs> course, she was joking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but poor old Susie thought she was being punished. <laughs> and she said she hardly slept all that night. Her head was throbbing. She, she'd made a bad mistake. She didn't do like she was supposed to do. She still had never attended an argument. She went down the hill after she was so embarrassed and mortified. So her first argument was the next morning after she cleaned the tomb. <laughs> and she told us later that while she was cleaning the tomb, she was asking Baba to please open her heart. So we have our kids. The prayers. <clears throat> they start, everybody starts singing the Gujarati Arti. And Susie starts bellowing out the words in Gujarati. She didn't have the words, she'd never heard it in her life before. She was singing it. One of our daughters is on one side of her, another daughter on the other side, and they're staring at her and she's just singing away. <laughs> Nobody knew how it happened. We, we asked her down the hill, I said, now do you know, do you know the words of it now? She says, when I'm up there, I do. <laughs> <laughs> and she did. So that was the, that was the high spot of, of that trip. And uh, since then, it just gets better and better. Right? Twenty of us were at one southeast gathering, counting children and grandchildren. And uh, we just been so blessed. 
We don't have one of them who, who, who says, I'm just not interested in this guy. You mind? You know, not, nobody. They, so far, they, they all love Papa. So that's, that's almost as great a gift as, as we received on our 50th birthday. <laughs> How's my time? Right? Yeah. Did, did you ever tell Don that the contest was rigged? Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I don't like oh. that. Uh, might get back to him? Yeah. Oh, I wouldn't I would dare tell him that. <laughs> I don't know how he would react. <laughs> but I mean, he would laugh about it, but I'd just soon not tell him. <laughs> yeah, it, changed, it, it really changed his life, as it, it changes all of our lives. He does construction work. He still enjoys a couple of beers, but but he used to enjoy a dozen beers maybe after he finished work. And, and now he's now he's moderate in his habits, and, and he's just sweeter all the time. And he's a he's a, he's, he's a wonderful worker and a wonderful son and a wonderful father and grandfather. Now he's got one one granddaughter. We were, some of us were talking yesterday, or, or this morning, when was it? Uh, about, uh, I guess, Steve. Was saying, uh, talking about who's your favorite saint in here, and, and we were discussing favorite saints. Asking me about who is my favorite saint. It's hard to make that choice, but among the women, Rabia Basra and, and, and Mirabai are, are my favorite saints. He said Teresa of all of us is. But I like Rabia and Mirabai because they had to cope with so much adversity. Even though Mirabai grew up as a princess, really. I mean, she. She soon became one, and she grew up in having everything. She had great diversity. For anybody who doesn't, doesn't know the story, I'll just say briefly. Wallace said sweet things about Mirabai, too. How she wandered penniless, radiant in her rags after she gave up a kingdom to, to follow God the way she wanted to. When she was a child, She's watching a, a wedding procession go down the street. And those of you who have seen wedding processions in India know that they're very elaborate affairs. And she saw the beautiful bride and the resplendent bridegroom and all the finery. And, and she says, who is he? And her mother says, he's the bridegroom. He's, he's the lady's bridegroom. And Mira, by, Mira says, uh, Mother, who is my bridegroom? And her mother said, The Lord Krishna is your bridegroom. So shortly after that, a wandering sadhu comes up and knocks at the door and gives a little girl a statuette of Krishna. And she keeps it and treasures it, and, and she considers the Lord Krishna to be her bridegroom. Then she becomes engaged to the prince, who becomes the king, and now she's the queen. But she still, and, and she told me, she told her husband, that I'll, I'll always be faithful to you and loving to you, but the Lord Krishna is my is my greater love, the Lord Krishna. And he understood that. He was very tolerant. She loved to sing and dance ecstatically. She was writing songs. She would go feed the poor, and if they came to the palace, she would, she would give them food. She embarrassed some of the other people in the palace with, because of her religious fervor. And the king built a special temple for her. 
and she would entertain the, the sadhu and the dervishes who would come and they would all sing together and she would dance. And then the, her husband, the king, was killed in battle. Killed fighting the Muslims who were invading India at that time. And the king's brother became king. And he and his wife didn't have that tolerance for Mirabai that her husband had. And they tried to curb her religious fervor and it wouldn't work. So they tried to murder her. One thing they did, they had a cobra in a bouquet with a cover on it. And it was given to her. And uh, she asked, well, what are you, what's in here? And they said, a Shalimar. That's kind of a, a religious statue, I think. I think Shalimar is the right word. And she opened this up, and, and the cobra's not there. There's a Shalimar there. <laughs> According to one legend, when the, the king's wife told her she ought to drown herself, she tried to, and the water threw her back up on shore. <laughs> they, they had her sleep in a special bed they prepared with, with uh, needle-sharp, poisonous darts, and she slept on it just as though she were on feathers. It didn't bother her. <laughs> but after a time, she got tired of causing so much unrest. So she just walked away from the palace and went wandering. And everywhere she went, people now were recognizing her as a saint. She's our great soul. She would sing everywhere she went, her songs. And, and uh, there's even a, a legend that she met the great Kabir. But if she did, he was, he was over a hundred years old at that time, but he did live to be over a hundred years old, so it's possible. Possible she did. Another legend that at a special religious conference, uh, Kabir said he wouldn't go unless they invited Mirabai. It may, it may just be a legend too. But she became well known, and the pe people, the populace of the kingdom, were seething. They didn't like it that Mirabai was gone because all kind of calamities befell the, the kingdom after she was gone. They had droughts and, and all kind of problems, unrest. So they were about to rise up against the king. And he said, all right, I'll try to get her back. So he and some of his ministers go to where she is. She worships in a Krishna temple. And they beg her to come back. She can do anything she wants to, she'll come back. And according to the legend, she said, I'll have to consult the Lord Krishna. So she went to the temple, according to legend, legend, and vowed to the Lord Krishna, and he received her into himself, and she never came out. She realized God. And her body was gone. So that's the legend. But her songs are still sung all over India. And in this country now, there's so many, many books about Mirabai's songs and, and poetry that, that she's well known now, hundreds of years after she lived. Amazing. <laughs> Hey, Baba had said that Kabir was a perfect master. Yes, he did. He knew he was God, but he was one of the perfect masters. Yes. Yes. Baba did say Kabir was the perfect master, and Kabir, Kabir's life is fascinating too. For those of you who haven't, who haven't read it, he was he was abandoned as a baby. And a Muslim couple found him lying on, as an infant, lying on in a bed of lotuses. 
picked him up. Apparently, uh, evidently, they think he was of Hindu blood, but the Muslim couple very happy to have the baby as their own and raised the baby and they gave him the name Kabir. There's a long story about that because the priest consulted his books and it kept coming up Kabir and he says this child should be named Kabir because Kabir means great one and he, he's a humble bird, you know, and then he said no you, you shouldn't name him that, he's not entitled to that. And so he checked everything again and came up to beer again. <laughs> so he was named Kabir, which means great one, and he was a great one. Mm -hmm. And he he wanted to become a follower of the famous Hindu guru, Sad Guru. What was his name? I can't remember his name. Anyway. This famous Guru had some Muslim disciples, but all of his friends told him, "No, no. Wait, you you get a good Muslim master. He won't take you. You're a Muslim." So he thought of a plan. Every morning, this Guru would go down the steps to bathe these great big concrete steps on the Ganges and Benares. So early in the morning, Kabir hid under one of these steps in the shadow so that when the guru came down the steps, he would step on him without meaning to. And he stepped on him and called out, Ram, Ram! And Kabir stood up and said, Thank you, my master. Thank you, I will obey you. He said, What do you mean, master? Since when have I been your master? You gave me a mantra. You gave me the mantra Ram. And I'll, I'll repeat it and I'll follow you, my master. <laughs> and the guru had a sense of humor. <laughs> and said, all right, that's, accept that as your master, your uh, mantra. Repeat it. Think of God constantly. And it wasn't long before it was obvious that he was an advanced soul. He was a great soul. Many miraculous things happened. I'll skip over to near his death. When, when he was close to his dropping the body, he tells his disciples, I want to go, I'm not going to drop the body here, but the Benares. I'm going to this, there was a, a town some distance away, where according to legend, according to legend, people who die in that town come back as monkeys. <laughs> and according to legend, if you die in Benares, you'll have a great birth. He went there to prove a point. He said, this is all foolishness. That's where I'm going to drop the body. And that's what he did. Shortly before he dropped the body, his disciples, composed both of Muslims and Hindus, got to arguing. The Hindus said, we're going to cremate his body. The Muslims said, oh no, we're going to bury his body. They were still arguing about it. And somebody went to check the master. He wasn't there. He dropped the body, but in his bed, according to legend, was a, it was full of flowers. So the Hindus took half the flowers, according to the story, and cremated them. And the Muslims took half the flowers and buried them. It may be legend, however, there are two tombs, two Kabir tombs. One is one the Muslim, one is a Muslim mosque, and one is a Hindu temple. Mm -hmm. So and Baba went to both both tombs. Anybody have any questions? A request? Okay. I'll tell about one of my, a couple of my favorite male. Oh, oh. I noticed, I noticed reading the item posted to the refrigerator 
at the Page's house that I'm talking about the history of this book, and I haven't talked about it yet. I undoubtedly, when Mahu called and said, what are you going to talk about, I said, I'm going to talk about how if we love Baba, he falls in love with us, and these saints and masters show that by their lives. And, but it can happen to any of us. If we fall in love, really fall in love with Baba, he starts falling in love with us. Because it, as Eric puts it, God is love, and love must love. So anybody can have Baba for your divine lover. All you have to do is love him. Each of these saints and masters had that kind of love for God. When Peggy and I went to India in 1973, Erich took us on a tour to Alora, and all the time in the bus, I'm sitting next to him. <laughs> Erich is asking him questions, and he's talking. <laughs> I didn't let him stop, and of course, when we stopped, then he's, then he's talking about, this is our Rangzeb's tomb, let's go up to Sai Baba's cave, where Sai Baba used to sit and look out over the tomb of Zarazari Zarbuk, his master, who died 600 years ago, but he was Sai Baba's master in an earlier incarnation, and in, in his last life, he still, he was still the only, only master that anybody knows about, only perfect master. And he'd sit in that cave up there. Well, Eric, told a lot of stories. In Mondali Hall it happened while we were there. He was telling so many wonderful stories about Rabia, Ramakrishna, Kabir, Hafez, Rumi, that during that visit I started working up an idea for doing this book and I talked to Eric about it. He said, that's a sublime project. That's what he said. <laughs> you must do it, he said. And for years, every time I'd hear from Eric, you know, weren't those the glory day? those were the days, those were the days you could write to. You could write to Eric, you, could, you might get it, you'd probably get an answer in his own handwriting. So incredible. And any time a friend of ours went to India, we didn't, we didn't go for some years after that first time. They'd come back and and tell me, Eric says start writing on that book. Mm -hmm. So as time went on, I did, and I discovered a nice little magazine called Fellowship in Prayer, which allowed me to write about Nehru Baba. I wrote several articles about Nehru Baba for them. I wrote about Ramakrishna, I wrote about Rabia, I wrote about Mirabai, I wrote about Milarepa, And those stories were the nucleus for this book. Each time I'd write a story for that magazine, I would have this, I would have some research done on for this book. Then came the time I wanted to get serious about it. And about that time, this fellowship in prayer organization announced they would grant, they would make grants for worthy projects, literary projects related to spirituality. So I outlined the whole book. I outlined the book. I sent them a letter. I told them I needed $2,000 to go to India to do further research to complete my book. They gave me $2,000. So then I had to write the book. <laughs> I mean, I wanted to write the book, but it took me, it took me a while, even after that. I mean, quite a bit of a while after that. But, 
that was uh, that was how it happened. And I wrote about my favorite saints and masters, most of whom, all of these except one, have been mentioned with Meher Baba, and he may have mentioned the other one, but I never was able to determine for sure. That was George Fox Bingham. I haven't been able to learn that Baba ever mentioned George Fox. I wrote to I wrote to Eric once. This time he didn't answer. This this was after he he was no longer answering all his mail. After all, when I wrote this book, Footprints in the Sand, Eric read every line and even found three typos that he told me about. <laughs> I couldn't believe it as old as he was at that time. Only published a couple of years ago. Three years ago, he did that. George Fox. Did you know about George Fox, Wendy? Well, well not until I read that book, and I love that story uh -huh. of George Fox. He's I thought my maybe favorite. you were a Quaker. <laughs> you know, some Quakers have told me they didn't learn that much about George Fox, even even being a Quaker. King James Version of the Bible had just been made available for anybody who had the money to buy one. George Fox bought a copy, and he was a shepherd. And he tended the sheep, he would read the Bible. And of course, when you read the Bible, and you really read the Bible, you come up with a lot of questions, don't you? And he did. And so, he started traveling around, talking to to priests and, and preachers and, and other people who knew something about the Bible and, and God, trying to get his questions answered. And he would always be told by the preachers, you know, we're not we're not expected to understand everything. We just we just accept it. We, we we're just supposed to accept it. That didn't satisfy. Him. So for years he would he would stay in, in homes of religious people as he as he walked around and asked questions. Nobody satisfied. Then he started having deep spiritual experiences, and God started talking to him in his own heart, and he came to the realization that God speaks to everybody if they just listen, and that was his message. And because he went around with that message, he would be beaten, he'd be thrown in prison, he'd be put in the locks, he'd be whipped, he'd be tortured, simply because he says, you don't have to go to the steeple house to find God. He's in your own heart. You don't have to put money in the, in, in the collection plate if you don't want to. God is with you all the time. And then they'd become enraged. They'd throw him in jail. And he'd keep preaching. And the sheriff became converted one time. And so for the remainder of his time in jail, every day the sheriff would let him out. So he'd go into town, to the town square, where he could preach all he wanted to. <laughs> and then he'd come back and sleep in the jail. <laughs> And there's one, one time, he, he got followers. I mean, he was so charismatic and so sincere that even though he went through all this, some people, some people start following him every time he, every time he spoke. So the group grew, they didn't call them Quakers at that, that time. Some of them were called waiters. There, there was a group called waiters. They would sit silently and wait for God to speak. And that was just exactly what George Fox was saying, so they joined him. And, and a lot of mystics joined him. Later in his life, one time, they charged him with sedition. They tried to get him to join the army, and he said he wouldn't fight on either side. That God was a God of peace. They charged him with, with treason or sedition. They hailed him up before the Lord Chancellor, Cromwell who was in charge of the country now. And Lord Cromwell says, they say you're a troublemaker. 
George Foster. Not I. I don't start the trouble. All I do is tell them what I believe is true. They start the trouble. Cromwell was very impressed with this man. He spent a lot of time talking with him. He told, told the authorities to turn him loose. He hadn't done anything wrong. Later in Cromwell's life, he asked George Fox to come and talk to him again, shortly before Cromwell died. One thing about George Fox I didn't mention that some of you may not know, he wouldn't, he wouldn't pay any kind of respect to anybody. He wouldn't take his hat off for anybody. If he went to steeple house to preach, he'd keep his hat on. If he was hailed up before the judge, he wouldn't take his hat off. They'd tell him to take his head off, he wouldn't do it. They'd throw him in jail. They'd say, okay, we'll, we, we'll throw you in the hole for three days and then we'll see what you got to say. They'd bring him back and say, take your head off. <laughs> he wouldn't take his head off. He also had certain speech mannerisms that irritated people. In those days, when you say the, you only said the to an inferior or to a family member. He would say thee to judges and magistrates and so forth, and that outraged them because people didn't talk that way. He made a, he made a trip to, to America, the West Indies, and, and uh, I guess, and finally at the end of his lifetime, they, he spent one long period in, in, in prison near the end of his life. He passed away surrounded by many followers, and he passed away in bliss. And I think he must have been a saint. The Quakers don't have saints, just like the, the Protestants don't have saints, but uh, I mean, they don't know if they have them. But he was surely a saint. And I think even though I was a, I rejected Christianity when I was about 15 years old because I couldn't reconcile the idea that God is love with the idea that he will fry you in hell though if you don't shape up. That's what they were saying. And even though I read, I read Emerson and Thoreau and Whitman and all these great souls who, who really were influenced by, by Hinduism. I still didn't know enough about these thoughts to accept it. I hadn't read enough. So for many years I thought I was an agnostic, thought I was an atheist. But if I'd known about the Quakers, if somebody had taken me to a Quaker meeting, I might have, I might have embraced them. Just sit silently and wait to speak if you feel, if, you, if, if, if God is telling you to speak, speak. I think that's very nice. Are there followers of Quakers today? Well, the, the Quakers are all, were all inspired by George Fox. I mean, are they, I, I, don't, I don't know very much. Uh, George Fox doesn't receive the recognition today that I think he should have. If in the Quaker bookstores they have books about him, but most of us don't see any books about him. Maybe it's time for a... Yes. Of course, they don't have the tradition of uh, uh, beatifying anyone's all the saints. Oh, right. No, they don't have any tradition of saints or person being. I would like to ask you a question of the Baba had once said that he was really oriented. Sufism, um, Christ mystical Christianity, and Dodgers. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't hear. I don't want to hear. He's, Robert, it says that he was reoriented. 
Right, this, right, this, right. Mystical virgins, right. and the donkeys. Right, right. And he's done it. He's, he's doing it, isn't he? Huh? And he is certainly doing it. Well, I mean, he, yeah. he not only formally yeah. reoriented Sufism, yeah. he, has, he, he has affected Sufism, reoriented in, yeah. in, in, in my opinion, in many, many wonderful ways in, in recent years. I mean, it, it, it seemed to me for, for years there was kind of a schism, but I think that that's gone now. I think it's the, uh, the all Baba lovers are or Baba lovers, whether they're in Sufism or, or and, not. And mystical Christianity is yes. being reoriented, I think so. Yes. How would you define mystical Christianity? What, what do you mean by that exactly? I would, I would find, you know, I, I don't think I've ever used that term before right now. However, uh, I think I know what Adele means. Maybe, maybe she can say something different. If not, I would define it as accepting the view that God is in everybody's heart, that, that God can be approached whether through an organization or through someone else or through no one. I mean, mysticism, of course, is the is really the path through the heart. Uh, experiencing God's presence. I think that's enough. A mystic experiences God's presence. You know, a lot of people, a lot of churchgoers don't believe that we can experience God's presence. They, they really don't. So they don't, they, there's not much mysticism in the Protestant churches. I mean, if there are mystics, there are some mystics, but they certainly don't uh, they don't do anything to uh, foster mysticism. I mean, they don't do much. Right. Well, wouldn't you say that, like, in the sense of Catholicism, in the true sense of the word, Catholicism, um, when you have your um, the breaking of the bread and the body of blood of Christ, what I was known growing up as Catholicism was that you had that mystical connection with Christ. You were actually taking his body and drinking his blood. It was not just in other, say, uh, Christian sects, a symbol of it. But in Catholicism, it was actually that experience that you were actually experiencing the body and the blood of Christ and having that um, transcendental experience. So that is well, that is a mystical form of Christianity. That, that certainly is, uh, is mystical Catholicism, or, or not only Catholicism, perhaps. I mean, if I think that if a person really experiences that... Some have. I've I'm sure of it. I'm sure of it. I mean, I think if we, if we experience... Same if we experience God is in you and in you and you and really really know that's true, that's mystical too. And it's the same thing, isn't it? And of course we we believe, I believe, that God is in everything. And anytime I take a a bite of food, actually I, I don't I don't always think that, but I, I do believe that's the form of God. So you couldn't exist without God. Right. The universe is one. The That's universe the is one. Absolutely, I agree. Any, any other? What, what inspired you to write this most recent? Speak, speak. What inspired you to write this most recent book about the saints? Baba, Mayor Baba, and Erich, his close disciple. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm inspired to do another one about women saints, by the way. Although there is a book, it's not very readable. And uh, I think we need, a, we need a, a, a very readable book about women saints. They're, 
probably to include Mara and Mani. I mean, we don't we don't know their their stature, but we don't know who's a saint, who isn't a saint. But but uh, <laughs> you know, they are at least saints. <laughs> book for uh, someone, um, I mean, I, I was in that phase when I was in my 20s, where I was looking for something like that. And there wasn't really too much available, of course, to do certain things. So uh, a readable book on saints is excellent for uh, groups, you know, that haven't really found uh, something substantial. That's how you go about it. Get, get a role model, especially now. Yes. There are not too many role models. Yes. I'd like to give that book to uh, a couple of young people. You know. Incidentally, if I may have a 30-second commercial, uh, <laughs> there, there, <laughs> there are copies of both of them. Both of these books. Uh, in the bookstore, and I'd be delighted to inscribe as many of them as you want to bring to me. Uh, and uh, if anybody has any other questions, you want me to tell another story? Or do, you want to... do you have anything? You've got a lot of pages marked. Is there anything else you wanted to read to us? <laughs> I have these pages marked here because recently in, in Hawaii, there's a great soul over there who uh, interviewed me twice on radio, and she said, what about this? And she said, you need to be on television. And I said, yeah, that's great. She said, I've got a television production company. And what she said is, why don't we do a 30-minute show on each of these saints and masters? Well, we, we weren't going to be in Hawaii very much, much longer at that time. So she did a one-hour show, one-hour interview with me about Souls on Fire and how it come, came to Bob. We did another one-hour show with Meredith Moon and me, most, mostly Meredith, because Meredith had never told her story publicly about coming to Bible before. And so this one is called Don't Worry, Be Happy. I think that Dinah has both both videos, by the way, and I expect there'll be more. But uh why did I bring that up here? No, I was what? asking about what you had marked in the book. Was there something you wanted to read? I'm, I put these in here while we were doing the hour-long interview about Souls on Fire. Because it was, uh, we didn't really plan it. And she was a very good interviewer and she's a, she's a great soul. She loves God and uh, is interested in Bible. So as she asked me about George Fox, I've got it marked here, in case I want to check a date or something. I could, I could wing it and talk about any of these, but if I want to check a date or get a name, I've got it. Well, what about footprints? You have some, something marked there, too. Mm -hmm. In footprints, in the sand, I marked, I marked some of the poems that I recently read when I was in Seattle, some of them. And uh, I'd like to read one. This one, uh, this is kind of a uh, spiritual history in, uh, in verse. I searched the world for you, I never knew. I searched the skies and the waters and the mountains. I never knew. I looked for you in books, in nature, in science, 
in bottles of all shapes and sizes, in pills and capsules, and in bikinis. I never knew. I never knew. I was hungry, but food did not satisfy. I was thirsty, but drinking only made my condition worse. I had given up all hope of ever finding you, all hope you even existed. I could not live without you, so I did not want to live. I never knew. I never knew. Then something happened in the dark of the night. You crept silently into my room, waking me from sleep. And you pierced the innermost chamber of my heart, the only place I had never looked for you. I never knew. I never knew. Without warning, you were there. I felt a stirring, a wrenching, a gentle but forced opening with subtle kisses and caresses. A part of me I had not been conscious of was being probed and stretched and enlarged, excruciating ecstatically painful, sweeter than honey, more intoxicating than wine, overflowing like a fountain, a geyser inside me. All I could do was gasp and moan and cry, yes, yes, love, yes, Bob, stay, stay, love, oh, love, oh, love. I never knew, Baba. I never knew. I never knew. Thank you very much. Are we reading that? Yeah. All right. Let's see, I read one to start it off, didn't it? Good things coming free. Good things coming free. <laughs> this one, this one was inspired by the near death experience. I had, at the time I experienced all this light and saw Baba, I also heard this incredible hum, which seemed to be flowing through my body and flowing through everything else. So the title of this poem is, Hum Away, Sweetheart. I thought when I died, I'd find oblivion, stillness, silence, nothingness, the end of life and the end of everything. Instead, I found peace and joy in the hum of the planets, a new life unshackled and unbound. Within and without, an unseen dynamo spawned a mighty ocean current of energy, ecstatic stream pulsing through creation, penetrating and filling, while everywhere was heard the resonant hum of God's sweet breath blowing kisses. Now I know why the bees hum as they make honey. When the honey pot is full, it overflows and the orgy begins. Hum away, sweetheart. Your humming drives me wild. <laughs> 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 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much.